Hello, my name's Will Sola. I work for Drilling Info, a leader in oil and gas uh, solutions. And I made an open source project. It's called the CI Monkey. You can go get it there at GitHub. And I am open to any and all ideas people have on ways to extend it, make it better. It's currently in Bash, which is kind of heinous. So going to Ruby would be really cool. Um, but basically, I made it because I was doing the same tasks over and over and over. Um, we, you know, and I got really annoyed by that. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to automate this. This is really annoying. So what was the annoyances I was dealing with? Well, there was a few issues. We started a new platform, and this platform was very modularized. So we had a whole bunch of new repos being created. And these repos just were not getting Jenkins builds. They weren't having any CI on them. They were just, you know, just the typical developer thing, you know, not enough time. I got to get my code out. I don't have time to make a Jenkins job. So I would just notice these repos coming across when pull requests would come up in my email. And I'd be like, oh, I haven't heard of that repo. So I'd go out and I'd give it a Jenkins job and the next day do the same thing. And, you know, all our builds are basically the same except for what repo and organization it is. And so I was just making like two changes and giving another build and that was turning into my job. It was very, very annoying. Um, so I didn't like that. Because there were no jobs, because we had no CI on most of these repos unless I'd seen it, uh, we had a lot of regressions coming through. They, you know, there was no integration tests being done. They would just see the green merge button in GitHub and go, oh, must be good, merge. And then you know, it would get wrapped into our application, our application would get deployed, and then the QA team would find, oh, you can't even log in. What the hell's going on here? So that also wasn't very good. And then every now and then you, you come across these people who they're working on their Jenkins job because they've changed the way their build works. You know, they've switched maybe from uh, S, uh, play an SBT to ant for some unknown reason or something like that. And so they start working on their build and, you know, they're in there configuring it and punching buttons and it's not doing what they want and they get all annoyed and they just throw their hands up and delete their job and then they come to me and go, well, it's gone. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> it's like, what the hell happened? <laughs> like, and so I couldn't even go in to like the configuration and see what it kind of was or see what they were trying to do or, or try and fix it up. I'd have to go and remake them an entire new job. And that was one of the most annoying things in the world. So the CI monkey actually ends up solving all of these problems um, using several technologies that I've actually learned about at several Jenkins user conferences. Uh, last year, I gave a lightning talk on the GitHub pull request builder workflow. And uh, the two years before that, I learned about Jenkins job builder. And in using those two technologies, I kind of wrote this bash script that it, I call the CI monkey. And it just kind of ties it all together. And I think of the whole package as the CI monkey. And so for new repos, the CI monkey goes out for the organizations I specify. And he's, he searches all the repos in there for a Jenkins folder. If he finds one, he goes, OK, this must have a build, You know, move on. If he doesn't, then he'll check out that repo, try and figure out what type of uh, build it should be, and then lay down a template on it to make that type of build. And then he'll go and run Jenkins Job Builder against it, uh, against the Jenkins. Um, as far as regressions go, not only does this get me CI builds um, to get my tests run, but the GitHub pull request builder will actually allow you to see the status of what would happen if I merge this pull request right now. It will go out and run a merge of your branch with the, whatever branch it's going to and then run the tests against it. So we can actually find out before it even goes into the main line, what are the problems and whether you can keep a more stable uh, master or development branch or however you do that. And then for the cowboy coders, the guys that go out there and just delete their job and then come whining to me, well, since now all configuration for Jenkins is in the source code right there, right in their repo, I can either revert their mistake or I can you know, 
see what they were trying to do through their series of commits and actually go, oh, you know, you just need to change this one line or, yeah, YAML's kind of an annoyance when it comes to white space, but you just need three instead of two. And uh, so that allows us to get them to still be able to configure their jobs. Like, I don't want to get in the way of that. I don't want to get in the way of people, like development should be able to do everything development needs to, but it allows me to help them and not have to start from scratch. So I'm going to go through these three technologies, tell you about them, how to use them, uh, and then tell, end up with the CI monkey and tell you how we use that. Whoops, went way too far. So the GitHub pull request builder is a plugin for Jenkins. It goes out and it builds the merge of your code with the branch you're going to, as I said. But I actually think of it more as a workflow than a plugin. It allows you to get continuous integration on a feature branch level. So even before it goes into the main line, you can get continuous integration running. And so how do you do that? And what is the workflow? Well, you just kind of work as normal. You create your little feature branch and start making your changes. And then if you're doing test-driven development, you write your tests first, obviously. Once all your tests are written, you push your change up to GitHub, which you should have been doing already anyway, and you open your pull request. And it'll go out, it'll merge those codes, that code together, and it'll, you'll get a ton of test failures because you haven't written any real code. And so then you just continue to write your code and commit it and push it to GitHub. And every time you push up there, it'll run another merge build, and you just keep doing that over and over until all your tests pass, and then you're done. Profit. Um, so sometimes you may get uh, situations where instead of having more of a team controlling the repos, you have like uh, one person who like, I'm the owner of this repo, I'm the owner of that repo. And so if you open your pull request too soon, like if you're not doing test-driven development, so you just start writing your code and you just want to make sure you haven't introduced regressions, then you'll notice that you're pull requests might get pulled too soon because the test all passed, so he thinks, oh, you're done. I'm just going to merge that in. That, well, that's not what you wanted. You still have more to do. The feature doesn't work. You didn't write any tests for it because you're out of time or whatever reason you're not writing tests for it, so it's not going to work. And so one of the ways you can get around that is just put work in progress in the title of your pull request and remove it afterwards. Or what we actually do is we use a Kanban or uh, we use um, a Kanban flow, but you can, if you're doing Scrum or, or Jira, then you can uh, just go off the board. And so we'll mark cards as ready to go, and then that's when you go look in the comments to see what pull requests there are. That's when you see if the tests have all passed, you do your code review, you merge it in. So how do you actually do this? There, there's kind of two ways. If you have one giant monolithic code base where your tests are all in there and your code's all in there and it's been around for 30 years, this is probably the only time you're gonna hear someone say you're now in the easy part of it. <laughs> uh, because you'll be able to just run your build like normal. You know, you have all your targets, all your tests in there, so you just run it and they run against the merge of your stuff. If your tests are in a different job or you have several downstream test jobs, like an integration test and a unit test and a, a whatever other type of test you have, then you can actually have the main build build it and then it could deploy it or it could trigger another job that could deploy it and then you can keep passing the SHA and ref spec down the, tra the train chain until you get to your tests, and then they'll run against that SHA and ref spec. And so you'll actually be able to get them to all run their tests against the merge of your code. And then if your main build is blocked on the, your downstream builds, then if it fails, it'll go put that in the pull request, and it will fail, and you'll see that. If you don't block, you, you wouldn't actually see the test failure. So that's, that's a key step there. Um, you can also, if you have, as we have now, we have a bunch of Apple components that all tie into widgets that tie into the application. So what you can actually do there is you could uh, take your widget and have it change the, say you're using Bower to pull it in from GitHub, you can actually change the Bower file for your upstream application to go and pull your feature branch or even the 
if you can, pass the SHA and ref spec of the merge and then run your upstream tests of your application, pulling in your code and running your tests. If you're using something where you're publishing jars, then you can actually change the deploy location of that jar, go and trigger your upstream or downstream upstream build probably of your application and change the Ivy file or Maven to pull in from that new location that you're publishing to. And I like to make that just kind of a, a PR folder underneath where you're actually publishing to. So if we're publishing com drilling info, global uh, map widget, then you would just do map widget.pr, or you could even make an identifier on there and change the, the resolution to pull that. So you would publish it to a different location and then pull it in when you trigger your upstream build. But there's more you can do than just running your tests. We use uh, Wintersmith for a lot of our documentation, which will take Markdown and turn it into a web page so that other people can see it. Um, we run GitHub Enterprise, so not we pay a lot per seat. Not everyone sh needs a seat always, but some people need to see the changes that are going in. So you can actually go ahead and do the deployment of your change to your documentation and have that deployed elsewhere so you can give it to your UI people or design people and they can look at it and go, oh, that, that's one pixel off, you need to move that over one. And so you'll make that change, push it up, it'll redeploy it, tell him, oh, you need to, you know, there, the change is made. He'll go and look at it and go, oh, that's cool, that's good. Um, you also have non-tech people that might want to see your documentation deploys. So your CTO, your C-level execs, and people like that. So you, again, it allows you to deploy it, and you just send them a URL, they click it in their email, and they go, yeah, that's cool. Because if you're just trying to show them the markdown, they wouldn't be able to even see the images necessarily if they're looking at just the markdown file unless it's, it's being rendered in GitHub. And so they may not even understand really what it looks like and be confused. We all know how the C-level execs are. They don't quite know too much about tech. I'm sure they're great at business. Um, so again, to do this, you would just kind of change where you're deploying to. I like to, again, make a PR folder in the deployment route. So we actually call our documentation site DEDS. It's uh, an acronym for something. So you, you can go to deds.drillinginfo.com and you can see all our published documentation. But you can go to deds.drillinginfo.com slash PR slash whatever the number is and see that being deployed. Um, you need to make sure to delete that deploy after it gets integrated. And I also like to close the loop by having the main build go ahead and comment on the pull request that the build it was integrated with so you can see when it came in. So your, your QA people go, oh, you know, is this pull request in the build that's in test? You go, well, what's the version information in test? They go, oh, it's build 69. And you're like, oh, well, that got integrated in 74, so it's out there. Or no, that, that uh, right, it got 74, so it's not out there. Or it, it's, it was in 60, so, so it is out there. What else can you do with it? You can actually deploy your entire application to another lo uh, location. So if you want to, say, have a demo for a really trusted external customer and show them the new features coming out, and you run with a release candidate branch and then your deployed branch, you could actually open a pull request from the release candidate to deploy and get that deployed and, and show your external customer that. Or if you are working together on a server and client piece, you could actually have your buddy working on the server part and he's committing and pushing his changes up and it goes and it deploys it while you're working on the client piece and you can continue, you can work while he adds a feature you you can consume it. He adds a little piece, you can consume that, and you can come together instead of waiting for him to get it all done, and then you do all of your client stuff. Again, I like to comment in the pull request what the number that integrated it, and also like to make sure to deploy or delete the, la the deploy that's associated with that pull request, otherwise you're gonna end up with some random leftover cruft because you're not all pull requests get accepted. 
that's also another good reason to deploy to a separate folder because you can just go in and periodically just delete the folder. It's not that big of a deal. Now I'll talk about Jenkins Job Builder. It uh, was created by OpenStack. They're the maintainers. They're most of the contributors to it. It's really cool. It allows you to put all your source code, uh, all your job configuration into, I prefer the repo, but you could put it into a separate repo. But it allows you to just check out a repo and see exactly how it's going to build. So you can go in and look and see, oh, is this an ant build? Do I need ant? What version of ant is this? You know, is this SBT? You know, how does this build so I know how to build it locally? Because you do kind of want the way you build it locally to match the way it's going to actually be built. It uses Python under the covers, which is a pretty easy language to understand and, and extend. Um, Jenkins Job Builder is, the community is, is pretty strong and they, they accept a lot of additions to it. I'm a pretty active committer there. The job config is actually in YAML which is a lot better than JSON with trying to match up curly braces or ant with the stabby things in my eyes all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, and it actually allows you to, if you have your development branch and then you have your release candidate branch and then you have your master branch which is in production and you've changed the way those branches are building, like you're moving to ant set 1.7, you could actually set up in your YAML file a build for the, br the master branch and one for the release candidate and one for dev. So as your change to play three moves through your environments, you can actually have that set up and be correct in your builds and not have like one build where you select oh, I'm building master now, and so it does some magic behind the scenes, and it picks the build to use. It'll just, just work, as Steve Jobs says. So some of the features of it, open source is always a big feature to me. It allows you to see, A, what's happening. Uh, I could make a little joke here about the NSA, but uh, I'll skip that one. <laughs> They're probably watching anyway. But uh, it allows you to add new plugins as all these new plugins are coming into Jenkins. You can go ahead and if you need it, just go ahead and extend it, add it, commit it back, you know, submit it back to the community and get it integrated. They're, they're really good about that. And when we actually ended up switching to Jenkins Job Builder, I was fairly new to Git and I didn't really understand it because I was coming from Subversion and I thought Subversion was the hot, cool thing. And yeah, no, it's definitely Git. But it helped me learn Git. It helped me learn to keep a tracking branch for upstream because I actually put all my changes into my master. And then when I pulled from upstream, it was an absolute mess. That was not fun to recover from. Uh, they use Garrett to do their code reviews and gating and plus ones. And I actually really like Garrett. I kind of would like to use it in my company, but it's a little more stringent than what we want right now. And then I also learned how to rebase and change my history. Because I, I went through like Subversion and just committed all my changes and pushed it up. And then I submitted it, and they just shot it down. Whack. No. One change, one commit. And I was like, OK, how do I do that? <laughs> so I had to go find out how to go through and interactively rebase my history on my branch and make you know, one commit and then put my open, uh, the OpenStack ID on there for the change so it would get hooked into Garrett correctly and everything. So it actually really helped me learn Git, it, and that was pretty cool. Now, some of the actual features of Jenkins Job Builder would be macros. Macros allow you to make a section that gets reused over and over, and it allows you, but it only allows you to do it for specific sections. So for your file, you'll have, you know, if looking at Jenkins configuration, you generally have like your builder section where you're, you're building with AN or SBT or bash. And then you have a publishing section down below that for what to do with the test results, you know, your JUnit section and things like that. Those sections actually correlate into Jenkins Job Builder as sections in your YAML. And so you can reuse a builder many times in your YAML files. So if uh, you have those multiple branches builds, then you can actually make a macro that's passing in all your parameters and then just call that within each build. And so if it changes, 
and it's common across all of them, you can go ahead and just change it once and it goes everywhere. I am not a fan of copy and pasting code. So templates are essentially like macros, except you can put all those sections together. So you can actually make an entire job and it's a job template and it includes a builder and properties and wrappers and publishers and things like that. And then you can use, reuse that in all of your jobs. So again, it cuts down on copy and pasting and, and less stuff. And then one of the most important features of it when, if you're trying to extend it is the fact that you can run the test and have it output the YAML or output the XML. It's going to submit to the API to a folder. And then you can go look at that and you can go to your test Jenkins and do this, what you want to do there and save it and look at its XML and compare the two. And what I've found is I've had a typo in the way I was implementing the plugin and what XML it was going to produce. And it gets sent to Jenkins. And Jenkins looks at it and goes, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to put it in there. And so then I'll go look at the config XML and be like, why is my section not there? What's going on here? <laughs> and it just, it can be infuriating and you can't figure it out and until you run the test and you can actually look and go, oh, I spelled it with a, a Z. There's no Z in Apple. What was I thinking? <laughs> It'll also catch syntax errors so you can get a little quicker feedback on that. So how do you use it? It's actually fairly simple. You just need Python, clone it down from GitHub, and then just run the setup. Then you have Jenkins Job Builder installed. And you would run things like Jenkins Jobs update and point to your YAML file. But first, you would need this configuration section in that folder so that it knows how to connect to your server, what the URL is, and I almost always set ignore cache to true because of the way I'm using Jenkins Job Builder. It doesn't notice that I have changes, really. Um, that might be something we will need to look into on it. Here's this commands you can run. You can run against the folder, which I prefer, because it'll actually take all your files and merge them together and then run it. You can run it against a specific file. You can run it even against a specific job within a file. So you have a lot of extensibility there. That's how you test it. And then you can just run that same Python install command that I showed you earlier to update it. And that's how you would update it if you've made changes to add a new plugin. You would just you know, clone the, the source code, make your branch, make your changes, run the setup, and then you would have it that change installed on your system. So here's an actual YAML file that'll make a, a build that might do something, but not nothing really good. I'll show you in a second. But here you have the name and a description, and then the project type, which I always use freestyle. I know Maven's supported. I think Matrix might be supported at this point, and there may be a few others. And then here we have just putting the link onto the job to the repository. And then I actually end up setting all my builds to build the default branch so that you can just change it in GitHub and it'll automatically change what's being built. And I found through this inject, if it'll actually go and hit, when the webhook comes and hits Jenkins, it'll run that script and figure out what the default branch is and then build it. And I was actually pretty surprised by that. And here you have your, your standard source control section where it's building my default branch. This is how you get it to build on a webhook. Here you can see what I was talking about with the build doesn't really do anything. Hello world. <laughs> and then I always like to put the git branch name on it so that I know what built without having to go pour through the, the console output to find that just to make sure the branch I thought built was the one that actually built. And so how would you use a macro? Up here, I've defined a builder macro that takes a parameter called task, 
and that is the targets it will run. And then you could end up with, you know, 30 lines of properties here. You could have all your Java ops on there. You could have, you know, for CI, you don't want it to fail on the first error. You want it to keep going and report all the errors to you, but it could be when you run it locally that you just want to find the first error, fix it, and go forward from there. So you could have a property like that. You know, you have your ant name. You could see how this could become a very long list of, of things that would be common across multiple jobs. And so you wouldn't want to copy and paste that. And then if you have to change it to ant17, you forget to change it in one spot, and it fails. So here's how you would use it within a job. You actually end up calling the macro just like you would call any uh, first class citizen of Jenkins Job Builder. And so here you have a job that runs your integration tests and one that runs your unit tests. And it's all set up using this, the common properties up at the top. Now, if you want to use a job template, you could never make a macro that has both that builder and wrapper section in it. You'd have to make a job template to do that. And so you would end up with a job template like this to run your tests, and then you might have another one that runs your, your Jenkins job builder jobs. And so you would set up templates like that so you can keep the name being the default, the branch that was built, and all your ant options. And that way, if the way you get your, like say you upgrade Jenkins, and instead of git branch, it's now git brunch because there's a typo. You can go and change it in one spot, and it'll propagate through all of your jobs. And then you would actually end up calling it like so. And I think, yeah. So it's, it doesn't seem too cool or too awesome when it's just in one file. But if you take all these templates out, and you take all your macros out, and put them into a central location, you now have something really cool and something that I actually call Travis CI for Jenkins. And this is actually our build YAML for one of our repositories with all three of the builds in it. And it's pretty cool how it works because we can put the macros and templates in Nexus, have the Jenkins job builder job, pull those down, and it'll end up merging with this file and creating all our builds. If you want to put a release build in, you could actually just add a line, you know, a line after this or between eight and nine called name dash release, and now you have a release build. So it's pretty cool stuff. How do we use Jenkins Job Builder? We actually do not allow anyone to make manual changes to Jenkins. Off every single time a new developer starts, they send me an email and go, "Well, I need access to Jenkins so I can configure my jobs." And I have to send them a link to our documentation saying you don't get access to configure your jobs. But I still want you to configure your jobs. You just have to do it this other way. And then there are a few people on my team that, that can actually go in and manually configure it. And this allows us to help people that are trying to create new jobs or change their jobs. We can go in and look at what's actually in Jenkins and then look at what they've done and, and help them along to get to where they want to be and say, oh, you, you, you didn't get the branch set right, or you didn't get, you know, you're, you don't have enough spaces in your YAML, so it didn't, you know, it didn't read that part correctly. And then I also have a JJB init job, and this is essentially your get out of jail free card. This is how you get out of a corner you've painted yourself in, because we have Jenkins job builder jobs that run every time there's a change to the Jenkins folder. Then we. Um, because of that, you can actually make a change that will cause your job to never run again. You know, you could, act, you could change it to be looking for your repo in public GitHub, but we, don't, we mainly only use private GitHub, and there's no way to, it's gonna go keep trying to check out from public GitHub, and it can't change to go point there. So you run this job, point it against your branch repo and org, and you can actually get it changed to, to work again correctly. Uh, we 
clean the cache and we don't allow the cache to be used to make sure that when we run the build, we're actually going to make the job look like the way it is. I've, because of this, that doesn't change ever. The macros used in there do change, and Jenkins Job Builder, I don't think, will notice that because the macros changed, your build is actually changed and it needs to reconfigure it. I've seen it just go, oh, I have already saw that, so we're good. So I, I make sure to, that the cache is not used ever, and then every weekend we go through and poke all the JJB jobs just to run them, make sure everything's what it is in, sort, in the repo and in source code so we know that what we have in Jenkins is what is there in what should be the record of truth, but is not always. And you could end up with some of us that have manual access, well, instead of just going in and changing the default branch, we'll just go in and quickly set it to what it needs to be, run that build, move on, and forget to change it back. So we have to make sure that it'll be set correctly. So now I'll get to the CI monkey. He goes out and he crawls all of our organizations that I have set up and he just looks for a Jenkins folder. If he finds it, he goes, oh, okay, cool, you must have jobs, and he moves on. If he can't find it, then he'll check out that repo, he'll put down a Jenkins folder, and then he'll try to determine what type of build it is, and he'll put down a template accordingly to what he thinks it is. And generally, the only things that change would be the name, repo, org, and type. And the type is what it thinks the build is. And then it'll go through and replace those four values so that everything is set up correctly and it sets up common um, sections for us. Uh, the central configuration also allows this, but we have you know, the, the same properties across everything, the same notifications. Everyone's notifying into hip, hip chat. Everyone's building using webhooks and not polling and things like that. But what's even cooler about it that you're not gonna get with the job DSL plugin or things like that is it'll also run scripts for you. So it will go out and find your readme, put it all into memory, and at the top of that, it'll put the build badges for your repos on there. It'll also go out and make the webhook for GitHub. If you're using Jira, it can go out there and say you want a new project per job so you can have failed builds open an issue or whatever, then you can have it go and hit the JIRA API and make a new project for it and et cetera. Whatever you want to do is up to your imagination. And so I have it running now at DI. It's been running for a few months. It's open source again. But uh, it lays down these three branches, these three builds for every single repo it finds. And if it can't determine what it is, it actually lays down uh, a template of unknown type that just fails. It exit, it does, uh, it echoes, I need a build, and then it does exit one. But it'll create your main build, so it'll build the default branch and make sure to wipe the workspace in case the, you have artifacts left over from changing the default branch. It'll lay down the pull request build to run the tests or any further stuff you would like to do. And one of the things I get all the time is, well, I changed the Jenkins job builder code in my pull request, but my tests are still failing. Why is that, Will? And I'm like, I, it would be really cool if it would go and run Jenkins Job Builder if it saw that your Jenkins folder had changed, but it doesn't do that right now. So my recommend, recommendation to them is to run the JJB init job against their branch and then run the build and, and see if it works and then get that pull request pulled in with their pull request for the code. And then... That was, NBC, <laughs> and then we have the Jenkins job builder job, which again, the pull request should probably be running in some fashion. I think what I might try and do is have it run 
against your pull request changes and right afterwards change it back to the main build. But what I like to do with the Jenkins job builder job is make sure to trigger the main build afterwards so you know that the changes you've made have left the build in a good condition. I'd like to give a big shout out to our sponsors. Thanks guys.